Um, well, the, the exhibition at Palatin House is um, really covering oh, over 50 years of work. Um, so it is, um, you know, uh, pieces from different decades, um, sort of patched together. Um, and uh, I mean, most of the work that's here really arose from similar, I suppose, either rebellions or um, contrary ideas. But, but I think really um, the subject matter changes a lot. Um, I think always in my work, um, the thing that binds it together is that there is usually something to do with the film industry in, in the work, um, one way or another, or um, you know, something to do with um, a, a substitute or a dummy or a, um, a, a, an enlargement of something that is part of a set or a prop or um, something like that. So there is that. I mean, it's not a kind of intellectual theming. It's a kind of, um, I suppose, a, a stream of consciousness, really, that I love the idea of things that are uh, falsehoods, you know, so that you make a dummit out of cloth and fabric that might work in the back of a uh, a set because nobody's going to eat it, but in real life it wouldn't um, it wouldn't be very palatable. Um, so, um, and I think too, um, my work is serious in many ways, but often it's a sugar coated pill, <laughs> so it uh, it may have a little spike in it, um, um, but uh, seemingly humorous. So, um, yeah, that kind of thing would would bind it together. I, I'm quite likely to get quite cross with pieces I've made, you know, that I go in and out of, of, of liking them, thinking, you know, why ever did I do it like that, you know, or something like that. So I don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty critical of my own work, um, and sometimes I, you know, like it, uh, and then, you know, when I've made it, and then I go back on it, and I think it's um, something that I would revise or I would do something differently looking at it through a lens of a later period. But having said that, there were some, some surprises because I was very nervous about the sorceress piece because I knew it needed some restoration work. And I wasn't quite sure how I felt about that kind of hippie period of um, more decorative pieces. Um, and uh, and it, it's held up pretty well. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely, and I was I was very glad to see the condition that the, the pieces were in it wasn't quite so bad as I thought it might be in some cases, um, but also you know that um, you know the pieces brought together. I was concerned about the idea of flow, and I mean when I do an exhibition in a gallery, um, it really is um, wedded to the space, and it's sequential usually, um, and you know it very much has a, it's not a narrative, but it, I just describe it as a flow. Um, and if you're covering such a long period of time, um, you are very different people in different decades um, in many ways as, as an artist. And so I was um, concerned about that, you know, whether um, the pieces would marry, whether they had a cohesion, whether there were common threads that you've alluded to. So, you know, the idea of, um, you know, keeping, uh, keeping the show together and not having it grasshopper all over the place um, was, was something that I was thinking about. And that, I'm pleasantly surprised by that. I mean, you know, I, I guess, I think an artist does not really know uh, his or her own style, you know, and what binds it. So it, it's one of those things that I think somebody else would see connections that I don't see. I mean, I make decisions that are within a zone, probably, that um, I'm not necessarily um, conscious of any of that drive, yeah. And of course, it's, it's everything in the show is cut in some way. So somehow, cut and piecing is very much a part of the way I work. And I think it's you know the the piece thing is a very feminine concern in a way that that you put dif different things together. Um, and you could say that women are very good at synthesizing different pieces of things, whether you take it to the uh, culinary arts um, or raising a child where you're, you're putting information together in a way that is compatible with a child's you know, learning abilities and so forth. So you, you're gathering, you're pulling together, you're um, stopping and starting. So you know, I always think about tapestry in that way. I did a lot of tapestry after my second daughter was born because it was something that I could pick up and put down. 
um, you know, because I placed the child ahead of that. Um, so, um. Well, self-sculpture, um, you know, is an important point, I think, in my work. Um, at the time I um, first thought of it, I didn't know about um, Oldenburg, nor did he know about me. <laughs> and, uh, and it was, you know, to me, it was the, uh, you know, fantastic rebellion. Um, I was at the Slade, and um, uh, the Slade was certainly dominated by a, a male ethos. Um, and male painters would say, you know, women just don't get it. You know, you, you have to have this sense, this thing that, that women don't have, and it's, it's about grist and angst and passion and blood, you know, and all this. And um, so there was this kind of air of, hey, you don't know what you're doing, lady. Um, and um, I, you know, thought that was pretty funny because coming from California, I didn't ever feel that as a, a growing up little girl or, or young woman. And um, I was on the number 30 bus, I think, is it 30 or 33, I can't remember, or 14, but passing. Herod's, and I was thinking I really wanted to make some flowers because I couldn't afford them, um, you know, to have in, in the bedsit I was in. And I was trying to mold through how you could make flowers that was kind of a, a material or a, a form, a format, a design that was actually well blended with the flower itself. And um, I was thinking plaster, no, that's too hard, and wood, it's too hard, and you can't touch it. And, you know, it isn't warm or it doesn't feel like a flower. Um, and I suddenly thought, oh, wait, I can make them in cloth and um, went through that. And literally by the end of the, the bus route, when I got to Brompton Road or whatever street is near where I live, um, I'd had 10 sculptures in my head, you know, of different things I could make that would be, you know, warm and yielding and, you know, actually like the subject. And so cloth, you know, for me was, a huge rebellion and a huge um, sort of a different language that I knew that the boys didn't know. You know, that you're turning a two-dimensional surface into a three-dimensional object. I knew that if you put cloth on the bias here, you could make a nose, you know, and you could dip in to do the nostrils. And I could think of how to make an ear or a head or a hand. I knew the body, I knew anatomy from pattern making. So it meant, meant that I could skip the anatomy classes, which I wanted to do. <laughs> You know, um, uh, so I mean, I think cloth was part of all that, you know, that it, it, it looks benign, and, um, but it isn't really. It, um, at that time, uh, there weren't cloth sculptures um, that I was aware of. I don't think anybody was doing that. And that's also been an important thing to me, to, to break ground. I don't like staying in the same place. I like, I like um, you know, finding something that I think hasn't been done and perhaps inventing a new way of handling older materials or taking um, a risk with something that maybe hasn't been tried before. So I alluded to the tapestry that I don't think anybody had um, thought of doing three-dimensional tapestry, so I thought that would be interesting. So I'll make a clay head, do a pattern on the clay head, then take it back into the tapestry canvas, then embroider it. And so I did some masks like that. Um, so it's, it's that, it's trying to find paths, you know, new paths, and see, see what happens, you know, so. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, um, it, you know, trying to cite people who influence you or that are meaningful to you, um, I wonder if about the word influence, in a way, there's a kind of compatibility. I, I think for me, um, it's undeniable that parenting really influences you. So, so in your uh, Academy Award speech, you thank your mother and your father and, and you know, all those things. Certainly my mother was a huge influence because she was an independent woman. Um, she was a collaborative art maker because she had a ceramic business. She had people working for her. She became a printmaker. Um, she um, was independent to the point where you know, she was a role model that I didn't know I wasn't equal, you know, in England. I came here as a child of California. All the women I knew worked, and they worked either as 
printmakers or, or dress designers or uh, actresses or whatever. So, you know, they were working women doing jobs that they chose. Um, so, so that sort of soup of my stepmother is a, a dress designer, my mother is a, um, you know, printmaker, a ceramicist, a collaborative artist in her ceramics. Um, that was a big sweep. And then I think you can say that going into university, there was a, a, a deficit of women lecturers. So it starts to zero out. And there was a deficit of women represented in uh, the reading that we did in um, uh, English Lit or American Lit. Um, and then of course, when I came to Europe again, a few women were, were appearing. Um, I happened to live in the house of Alison and Peter Smithson. That was a partnership, an equal partnership in an architectural setting of a strong woman as part of that. So that fit my paradigm. Um, but by and large, it was unusual uh, for women to be showing in galleries. But then I, you know, somehow was very lucky in the Young Contemporary Show, getting into the um, Four Young Painters Show after that. Um, so again, I didn't see the gap, mind the gap. Um, <laughs> Um, and when, you know, Robert Fraser picked up my work very early, I, again, I, I didn't know that there was a problem. Um, so I think, uh, you know, those influences are there, they're largely male, but anointing the female, so I was kind of lucky there. Um, you know, but then moving on to later times when I had my own daughters, certainly your, your children profoundly affect you. You become a different mother for each of your children and you grow um, into the direction of their interests and their capabilities and, and um, their, uh, their needs. And, and so I think that's another whole area. And then, you know, suddenly there's the, you know, the woman comes into my life that's a dealer. And so now I'm working with uh, female dealers. My dealer, um, gallerist in, in Utah is Diane Stewart and, and her powerful impact on the arts there, Myla um, here, um, you know, in the Gazelle Gallery. So it's, you know, I think the stream has changed, you know, and when we look at um, women artists like Marisol, uh, my mother and I both just adored her work. It was wonderful to see a strong woman artist in the early 60s. Um, so I think you know, I would say that it's a salad of influences um, and uh, undeniably genetic influences and undeniably proximity um, of, you know, kids and your gallery leaders and so forth, so yeah. <laughs> well, I, I think um, when I was younger, um, my political collect connections were probably mostly with my dad and thinking about the McCarthy era and you know, sit him down in front of the television and say you have to you have to watch um, you know Edward R. Murrow on this particular day <clears throat> excuse me because um, he's going to be taking on this man and my dad was a very strong union uh, man so politically um, I grew up in a, a very liberal left-wing atmosphere um, but I think when I came to England, um, because I didn't know the culture, didn't know the, the government that well, I was rather disconnected from that. Um, I happened to be in Los Angeles uh, when Kennedy was shot. And of course that was a, a kind of miasma of, of sorrow and um, political awareness. And you know, the, the, my personal growth in terms of, you know, social awareness, I think, has been an arc really out of the, the kind of dilettante atmosphere of the 60s in some quarters, and in other quarters it was quite active with Van Bonham, and Green and Colin women and things like that, that really I should have been at, and I wasn't. <laughs> um, but um, uh, I think as time went on, um, my sort of political um, angst or responsibility um, began to really be, you know, something that came into the center of my awareness. Um, and uh, I think it's social responsibility, really, that um, you have to take up at a certain point. 
and if you can speak with your heart without you know being uh, didactic or soapbox kind of um, you know um, efforts I think that that's an important role that the artist can play because they can see the future coming if they will um, and you know we act as it's too lofty a phrase to say shaman, but we should be seers at the front. Um, we should be in a territory that maybe uh, sees things that the general public doesn't. Um, and we should be able to speak about that um, without overdoing it. You know, I mean, I think you, you can um, hammer away at a point um, too hard and lose your audience that way. But I think, I think with a, in a genuine sense, you know, you need to do an analysis of things from time to time. And really that, that you know, takes me into the notion of something about Sergeant Pepper in 2004, when we were between the, the first Bush administration and his possible second administration, it became very clear to me that um, things needed to be said. Um, and I was angry about the Iraq war. I was angry about the response of America to um, the perceived threats. Um, and so, oddly enough, one of the vehicles that I chose to work on was looking at Sergeant Pepper again and looking at the lack of politicizing that was in that, in a way that, you know, let's say that if you say, take a look at the cover, who there is a catalyst for change, who is a social, um, a person who's changed society, it's much more about celebrity. Um, it's not to say it's entirely, but much more. And, um, and I think, you know, taking the stats of 12 women on the cover, um, and that half of them are fictional, um, you know, is, is a terrible thing to happen and uh, needs an apology, which the big SLC Pepper mural I did in Salt Lake was partly that, um, to have a sort of a reckoning and a, a, an awareness of your own, um, you know, I won't say mistakes, because we're young. Um, but but your own uh, sort of missing the point. <laughs> so um, yeah. So so I think yes, those those things are are important for artists to take on, even at the risk of um, you know being unpopular. Um, it's the people who stand alone that we often remember, you know. And um, artists certainly are often you know solo. <laughs> Yes, and I, because, because our, um, I mean, if you think of the posters uh, of Obama, what's the name of the artist that did that? Um, the, okay, um, what's his name? Um, I want to say Somerville or something, so anyway. Um, anyway, the young man who did the poster of Obama um, cut through something in your psyche. Um, that's art representing a president that won the election. Um, and it's Shepard Ferry? Yeah, Shepard Ferry. Um, so Shepard Ferry's poster of Obama is, you know, highly significant. I mean, there's, there's all sorts of these, it's suddenly, suddenly somebody comes around in the back end of that and says, oh, he's compromised, he was a graffiti artist and he's, you know, he's merchandising. Well, good luck to him. I mean, I, it's a beautiful poster. And I think um, the, the idea that um, art can personify something in a way that um, a photograph doesn't, all you need to do is go back to Rowlandson and uh, some of the political cartoonists that began to use the lens of cartoon um, in, in the vision of seeing our politicians. And so we have wonderful political cartoonists who are artists who make incredible forays into the arena of humor and politics. And they'll drive social change with that kind of um, vivid artwork. Um, and so uh, the fine artist doesn't have the same tools as the cartoonists in the way they, they tackle it differently. But the fine artist certainly can reveal that, the poet reveals it, the playwright. Um, you know, to, to tell those stories through visual art, um, it's a very subtle matter because you're not banging people over the head with verbals. Um, and yet our performance artists 
will have much more of a choreographed experience that um, perhaps unpacks um, various forms of injustice. But I think, you know, the memorials that are being created to lynching, the lynching memorial, I mean, those sculptures are searing. The work of uh, Jason DeCaris Taylor, I just didn't make me weep. I mean, I suppose you saw the lions the other day. Um, how, how, tell me that isn't an emotional moment. And when you see the slave um, people underwater, um, I mean, they're, they're stunning pieces that, that rip your heart open. And, and sometimes that says more than all of the um, accurate journalism. And so, yeah, we need to go there. And art, the art can be the vehicle for that. Well, I have to, you know, pay, pay credit to the fact that I was very lucky. Um, so I had an easier time than many women artists for whatever reason. And um, so that said, um, I would say that women artists today um, are in a different tone. Um, and it certainly is easier. People, uh, the conscience is, is on display, the heart is on the sleeve, as it were, the conscience on the sleeve, um, in that, um, you know, we are seeing, you know, at galleries at last featuring women artists, even though in the secondary market they won't make as much money, <laughs> you know? Um, and I think we begin to see the value over the price. I think that's an important question that, you know, maybe we can get back to a more value-based culture rather than a price-based culture, that this artist is important because look at the prices he gets. Um, uh, you know, that is not where it is. Um, you know, artists are cheap to run. We don't need a lot of money. Um, it would be very nice if we just had a midway accomplishment. <laughs> um, and certainly the women are appearing men, you know, in many more galleries now. Uh, it's not even, the work isn't done. Susan Beatty is right. <laughs> we, we have a lot of work to do. Um, and, you know, we are at risk of, um, you know, perhaps uh, imbalance in a different direction, you know, as far as, the, you know, the uh, curse of being called shrill. <laughs> um, you know, we, we, but we have more to do, I think. <laughs>